Good evening, everybody. I'm Harold Page, alcoholic. Amen. And I'm going to always be an alcoholic. If you found out you won, you're going to always be one, too. Yeah. And today I'm grateful for that, alcoholic and recovery. Uh, I want to thank Wallace for asking me back down here again. You know, years ago, some places I went, they didn't want me back. Uh, not in AA, but some of them other places. Uh, I want to thank my wife of 57 years for uh, being along with me tonight. Uh, we married 57 years. She's been at Alan for 37 years, but, but them $10 weddings will work. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she would tell you in her story that our marriage was on and off, and what I got on, got on one, she got off. You know, but I'm that grateful for that program. For Alan on, it helped make my sobriety somewhat easier. And my wife never brought up the wreckage of the past, and there was a lot of wreckage. And, uh, but I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful to see that Randy from Kenniston come down in here. And Dwayne and Penny, they live down toward Monroe area to come over. And I'm surely grateful to see Jonathan down here in this area, staying in this area for a while. Yeah, hopefully. He's a good man. And you'll get him sometime to tell you about him sending him back to the hog pen, you know. But I was, uh, you can tell I wasn't. Uh, this is New York Avenue, and I've been up there drunk before in New York. But I wasn't raised up there. You can probably tell by that. I, uh, I'm not raised. I'm from New York. I was, I was raised or hatched up here uh, in West Stanley County. That's about 65 miles up west of here. Uh, and a little suburb of a community called Fanger. It's right next to Thun. Yeah. Yeah. Some of y'all know where I'm talking about. There ain't no such a place. Well, you come down Highway 73 up there, and you it's a wide place in the road, and you'll see it. But we live about three miles down there in the woods in the suburbs, uh, redneck yeah. suburbs. <laughs> <laughs> Road up around with Ken folks down in there. 80% of them was kin to us. All know one another, cousins, everything. And there's beautiful country up in there, hilly, and a lot of little creeks and branches running around, and everybody made liquor, corn liquor. And uh, I helped do that, too. And uh, I'm going to do something. Uh, we were down there at Georgia, and uh, he had a, Wallace had a little sniffle up there, and I had him a real handkerchief, and I got up there, and I get a sniffle, too, and he said, Darn, Harold done pulled out a horse blanket up there. You know? <laughs> I don't think that. <laughs> Anyhow, I get in a nice warm place and everything like that, get the sniff. Uh, I'll tell you this story about everybody made liquor up in there, corn liquor. Just about everybody. <clears throat> This old boy was sitting down there at the creek. He's talking about that snake business. He's sitting down at the creek running off liquor down in the evening. He started that morning getting tired and hungry. He didn't have anything to eat. He had that fire going around that pot there, and you had to keep it just right. And that liquor running down that little stream. And he was real hungry. He, seen all, he looked down in the creek there, and he seen this old moccasin swimming up through there. And he had, uh, a big water moccasin, and he had a big old bullfrog in his mouth. So he reached down and grabbed that old snake and got the frog out and threw the snake back in the creek. And he skinned his skin off of him, stuck him on a stick, and held him over that fire and cooked that frog. And he ate that and took him a drink of liquor, and he looked down there. And that old snake laying right there in the creek, right pitiful looking. And he's thinking, well, darn, I... Tuck his supper, I ought not have done that. So he just grabbed the old snake back up and pinched his mouth open and poured about a half a pint of that corn liquor in him and throwed him back down there and in the creek. And he was sitting there, and about 10 minutes later, he looked, he felt something bumping up against his leg, and he looked down, and that snake had brought him another frog. <laughs> Uh, 
They, uh, you know, I didn't hardly know any better around there. We, this old house uh, we lived in, it was my great grandpa's old house, and he was setting up on them creek rocks and had a two hole outhouse. We had a deluxe model. And, uh, and we had running water too, if you'd run, get a bucket full. <laughs> And I, we weren't dysfunctional around there. If you didn't function much, you didn't eat much. You know, if you was able to do something, you'd gonna be doing something, work, whatever. Uh, and I don't think we knew there's anything wrong with making liquor. There's a lot of liquor made down there, a lot of corn liquor. And there's probably still some being made up there. Uh, one old boy I went to school with, I think he's making some now, still yet. But he got in a building out off in the creek, you know, but uh, he kind of modernized. But anyhow, I was raised up around that. And I seen, uh, and I was all, I was around all this liquor and everything, and I never drank any of it. Uh, I might have had a toddy mixed up uh, with warm water, sugar, or some white liquor in when I had the crew for cold or something like that. But. Um, I don't remember ever feeling any effects of it, and I didn't care for it. I just uh, to get, uh, I just like to make it and uh, help make it, and I could probably make it when I was 10 years old. Uh, and I went to school down there uh, at Ridgecrest, a little school. That, uh, it was grades 1 through 12, um, 150 people in the whole school, and uh, about eight <laughs> faculty members run every time and they were then all the teachers were respected and we uh, learned the basics and uh, uh, everybody done pretty good and uh, anyhow uh, I didn't have any problem there uh, I made like straight A's just about I didn't have to study much just a knack for that you know and then well well but the thing was that we didn't, that home and all around there where I was raised, didn't put a big emphasis on a higher education, you know. Uh, a higher education, if you'd have got a job on the third floor of the cotton mill, you'd have been higher up. You know? <laughs> and if you wanted anything, didn't nobody give you a car, uh, none of that stuff. You didn't get no money. Uh, if you wanted something, you went to work and got it. So you quit school to get a job, to get a car, maybe find you a woman. Because uh, all them around there, we had to venture off to find one because all them around there was kin to us and they didn't play that game in the house. <laughs> that was sure enough hanging the fence in that neck of the woods. <laughs> but I left there and, uh, and went to work down at the cotton mill and making 90 cents an hour, and that's top pay then, or low rate, low uh, minimum wage. And I talked to one old guy there, and hey, I said, how long you been here? He said, like 20-some years. And I said, how much you make? And he said, same as you, you know, 90 cents an hour. And I thought, well, that ain't much future in this. <laughs> and so I stayed there a while. I, like I said, I never drank. And had old hot rods and stuff out, and, running around hunting girls and stuff like that, you know, racing cars. We had some pretty fast old cars we patched up. Some of them were done real good. And uh, I uh, worked resignation there and, and left on good terms, didn't drink, went in service. And uh, later on I wound up at Bragg down here and I went basic training coming. I didn't drink in service. And I seen guys were, when I was 17, I seen guys that, you know, on up there, 20 or something, I thought these old people, you know, 25 year old stuff like that, they drinking, and hell, we were making $85 a month or something, you know, that's pretty good. And they furnish you a place to stay and some food. Uh, I thought that was doing pretty good. And, them guys would go out and blow all the money and then borrow money and all this and get drunk and sick and get in trouble. And I, so I didn't have a reason to drink. I was happy uh, with life the way it was. Just, uh, just reasonably happy. And uh, all I'd ever wanted uh, 
was maybe find me a woman and get married and have a couple young ones in a little old house somewhere, a regular job. That's good enough for me. And uh, oh, I come in uh, uh, from Lee, Fort Bragg, and then was out at Oakboro, and that's where I met my wife to be, so. And uh, we got to Dayton when I got out of service, we got married. And she had finished um, business college and things. And she's a country girl. She's the youngest of ten children. And uh, we got to, uh, and we moved over to a little house. And, and our first son, which is like soon be 55 year old, uh, anyhow, uh, we were very happy. And I, I can't blame my drinking on something lacking in my life. Everything was there, you know, and happy. And, and was a good husband. And since I've learned how to stay sober, I've tried to be a good husband too, really. Half measures won't avail me 50% sobriety. It will avail me 100% drunk. So I can't be living lies and doing those things like i done at one time. Uh, had no intention of reading behalf of me and my wife, uh, uh, this man come by and I was working with the state, not the state that I worked for later without pay. <laughs> <laughs> and anyhow, driving a dump truck, hauling gravel, some things like that, and, and happy. And a guy, we were in Charlotte area, and uh, he seen me and I was about the only one working, you know, out there in that bunch. A lot of them, you know, like they said the Japanese invented a a shovel that would stand up by itself and they had to lay off 500 state workers. <laughs> but I, a lot of times you see that in government jobs, you know, uh, standing around the city and things. They, they like that at home and they'd, they'd be some working, one or two working like the Dickens and the rest, rest of them not. But, uh, and I was working hard and I didn't mind. I was brought up and worked hard. You know, if you want something, you work. If you you, a man's going to offer you pay, you give him your money's worth. So that's the way I was brought up. Uh, don't cheat nobody and things like that. And, uh, anyhow, he offered me a job you know, on the railroad if I would go qualify. And he asked me some questions. And I'd never been arrested, good health, good vision, married, and service behind me, and, and things like that. And, uh, he said, you, you're somebody we're looking for. Well, I went to work with that short line railroad, which became later uh, part of the Seaboard Airline then. It was Seaboard Coastline later. Uh, so we had to move to Charlotte because uh, I was a brakeman on the extra board on call all the time. I had to be close to, to go to work any time you know, as a new man with hardly no seniority. And a union job uh, is like five times the money or more than I'd been making, a lot. Uh, at the time, you couldn't make more than the president was making. At the time, with overtime and all, union scales and things like that. Uh, I, uh, well, we moved to Charlotte. We got us a little trailer, and then later we found us a house over there. And uh, our son, he, he uh, was our oldest son, was a little fellow, then he learned to walk in one of them little old trailers we rented, they were so tight and all, he could just do like that, you know. <laughs> but we got a better uh, brick house and moved into that. And you know, uh, uh, I worked a lot uh, uh, and was gone, not overnight a lot, but I worked a lot of long hours and uh, seen a lot of things and learned a lot of stuff out there. You see behind the scenes of the railroad, on the railroad, you see the ugly part behind the scenes. <laughs> And I remember, uh, I'd never seen winos. Uh, heard about them maybe, but I'd never seen them. And in Charlotte area then, uh, they were staying in some of them old places and all. We'd be on those yards switching cars and stuff, and they'd come up on fifth cent or something like that. And I kind of felt sorry for them. And uh, I would give them that. And some of them older guys are said, I oh, don't be giving them money. They they saw it ain't no good. I kind of felt sorry for them, you know. Uh, but I'd give them money, and you know, 
You couldn't have told me then that I would be doing some of those similar things like that one day. You couldn't have told me that. That's what alcohol done for me later on. I got in those shapes. And when I was little, them convicts would be down there digging ditches and laying pipe and cutting briars with a regional weed eater. And, <laughs> and my mama said, don't get down around there. They'd bang with a shotgun there on old brown trucks and had a cage on them. Don't get down around there. Them some mean people. Don't be around them. And uh, you couldn't have told me that one day when I was older, I'd be out doing that. And some of my family seen me doing it out there. You couldn't have told me that and no intentions. And now breaking in houses, stealing, and all didn't put me there. It was drinking. It was drinking. What went along with drinking? You couldn't have told me that when I, I was growing up and when I was happily married. And things happened to me like that. I didn't stumble uphill and everything. Uh, when I, well, I had a few years over there, them guys picked at me, I was real young. One of the youngest persons they had hired in years. It was quite hard back then to even get on with a company like that. And they uh, said, you ought to come out to them beer joints. And then in Charlotte, it was just beer in bars. There was no liquor. Uh, you had to go to ABC store and get that and stuff. But it was just beer. They said, you ought to stop by with drink a few beers. No. And I had seen that stuff in service and, and some of them things, you know, where they showed us all them films, like what you could catch going in them places and stuff the doctors couldn't even cure and all. And, <laughs> and show you them nasty films and real stuff. And kind of, I, I, would, I just didn't want to go in none of them places. You know what I mean. Because I know that there's something in there you're liable to catch. And, uh, well, I finally went in there and drank a few beers, and I caught alcoholism right off. <laughs> Didn't know a thing about it. Uh, but them places got to looking better. And I couldn't used to wait to get off them long shifts to get home with my wife and son and go around Charlotte and do things together, visit other friends we met. But when I started going to those places, it changed me, and my wife will tell you this, it changed me, it turned me into a different person. I wasn't the man she married. And uh, started drinking lying left her right off. <laughs> Where you been? Then I'd lie. And then, who you been with? Tell a lie. And uh, started drinking infidelity liquor too. <laughs> and then sometimes I'd get a hold of some liquor. It was confessing liquor. <laughs> and the men's aren't well received when you're about drunk. No. But I felt bad about doing things and didn't know, didn't know a thing about alcoholism. Honestly, after I started drinking, I probably qualified for AA within a couple of times of my life become unmanageable by my making, not my wife's. And my whole attitude changed about a lot of times, uh, not for the better. And I started doing those things that you shouldn't do, single or married. And uh, anyhow, I uh, mess around. And I'd always work, though I'd never been fired. And I'd always show up, and it hadn't affected me so much physically then. But uh, later on, uh, my wife, she got a bait of that, and she got her apartment. I'd got into riding old motorcycles in and carrying on and, and got scun up and got to drinking a little bit of fighting liquor back then. And uh, anyhow, uh, she got her apartment moved across town. I was there in that house and all, and had me a two or twelve up the front porch riding old Harleys in there and doing burnouts on them pretty hard wood floors and running the front end to the sheetrock and you know you got a bunch of fair weather friends too when you got a pad they called it back then and a place to go pile up and tear up and um, but I it come to realization now I never got a demerit out there working and everything and had a 
had a, the drinking not interfered, I had a great opportunity to do well with that company and knew that. Well, um, alcohol consumed me and I knew that I couldn't drink like I wanted to and work and hold up my end and do right. So what do you do then? And then my wife on to me, you know, uh, you're supposed to pay money and stuff when you're making money and all to your wife and young ones. And so what do you do when you can't hold up your end? You can't, you can't drink like you want to and be responsible, so what do you do? You run. I did. I drank running liquor. Now the law wasn't adding me then. I didn't never, had never got into nothing with the police. And how, uh, so I take off. And I worked resignation. I left on good terms out there. They begged me not to go. And I wish they'd have had something back then, and like VAC or whatever, helping you at work and telling you, you got a problem with this and that, because I'm sure some recognized it. Uh, you know, and would have sent me to some place where I would have become knowledgeable about where there was some help. So when I was down and out, I probably would have went. I thought we weren't knowledgeable about that then, not in that area. Uh, but anyhow, so I took off and got to drinking redneck hippie liquor. And <laughs> let my hair grow out in here and beard. And got me some bell bottoms and peace signs and, and a old van and painted some stuff all over. And I was good, creative, uh, and painting and doing things like that. I remember I would, I would paint the murals for plays and all in third and fourth grade in school. I was, God blessed me with a few talents later on when I learned how to stay sober. I applied some of those things and helped put groceries on the table at the house and retired from doing those things, uh, and carving and doing the, uh, special work and things for people in fine homes like they got around here too. But anyhow, uh, I lit out and uh, half my wife young and went on the road rambling. I'd wake up in places here and yonder and all. And then later on I wound up uh, on a bridge uh, looking at car tags to see what state I was in. <laughs> And you down and out when you uh, you out of cigarettes, power cut offs, barefooted, nothing to eat, and detoxing. You are alone, and uh, you some of y'all might have been there. And if you hadn't, I hope you don't have to go there, and you probably won't if you stay sober. Um, I hadn't had to get in those situations since God led me to AA and it showed me how to stay sober through people. The God that I, I had come not to understand and thought I was atheist, and I was telling a friend of mine a while ago, I said, a friend of mine in AA asked me, said, Harold, you know how many atheists are in hell? I said, no, I don't. He said, there ain't none. When they get there, they come to believe. <laughs> and this the road fellow said, in a grapevine one time in that center for he said, man can't be in his own heaven until he's been in his own hell, and most of us have been there. And that kind of set well with, uh, I said, that old boy probably drank some liquor. Yeah. <laughs> Coming to understand that. I can relate to things like that. But I would come back home and my wife that loved me and still does, she didn't know about al -Anon. she didn't know about AA. And uh, I had lost my license during the travels around. And uh, I was 39 when I got sober. And I was over three years sober before I got AAs helped me get driving license. And I lost them back then. And I think I had a permit one time for two or three months out of all them years, permanently revoked. I mean, drove in every state that I can remember, some I don't, uh, across from. I come from El Paso to uh, Shreveport one time, and I don't remember one inch of it. <laughs> but I had done a couple other things uh, than drinking. Uh, I'm not a dope head or nothing, 
But I'll tell you about my choice right there. One time I traded five pounds of marijuana for one pint of cheap red liquor. <laughs> well, I had plenty of that other stuff. The old man quit making liquor and went to the he grew in a couple of acres at the time, and we just bailed it, you know. Put a baler, he'd get $50 a bale for it, 75 pounds, you know. But it, it wasn't as powerful as they got now. But anyhow, he, my mama made him quit now. You could see it from the highway, just waving, you know. But a lot of the cops didn't even know what it was then. I'd done a few other things. My choice was drinking. It become my worst enemy. And then I started drinking a lot of puking liquor and dying liquor, hospitalizing liquor. It'd come back home and going around them liquor houses and joints and got in fighting liquor, cutting liquor and shooting liquor, and wound up down there in Georgia, Chain Gang of Wild and Mount Pleasant and them other camps up the road. That's why I was talking about that. I lived in a gated community. You had cooks, <laughs> had security guards, you know, all that good stuff, you know, but you don't get much pay in there. <laughs> but I tell you what, since I learned how to stay sober, I ain't had it, that I know I broke any laws or anything other than maybe speeding a couple of times. I've not had a ticket of any kind. I had them good fellows went and, and Took an oath to tell the truth about me where they'd give me a permit to drive again. I hadn't abused that privilege that I know in 33 years at all. Not one ticket of any kind that I know of. And uh, I haven't done any of those other things that you shouldn't do if you're married. I'm fortunate. My wife got an al on when I first got sober. And uh, she'd been a regular member regularly. Uh, for 37 years. And the longest time I've been without a meeting was four days, except back in the month of April. We had to shut our little building down for a month, not to have any meetings. And, uh, but that's the long, four days is the longest time I've been without a meeting. I regularly attend. Uh, and when I, I was, the way I got there, I'll get on about that. Y'all know how to drink and carry on, get into trouble and everything. I jump a lot of stuff about it, but there's a lot of hell going on. Uh, uh, it was pitiful. Never had, uh, my wife always worked and everything like that and kept insurance. Had not, I'd have still been paying doctor bills, hospital bills. I drank hospitalizing liquor and all kinds of stuff. But, uh, since I learned how to stay sober and stuff, I put a few dollars on the table and worked regularly. We hadn't, we didn't, we didn't have a place. We had a house. Uh, we didn't have a home, and uh, wasn't a bunch of bills owed, but there wasn't a bunch of stuff bought on credit neither. My grandpa, I remember him telling me when I was little, he said, "Boy, don't you never buy nothing on credit that depreciates." And I've always remembered that. I don't buy nothing on credit if it gets what less worth than it is to start with. Uh, and how, uh, since that time, when AA found me, and I'll tell you how I was found. There was an old boy come up to me and was fixing to go to work on this job down at the alcohol plant at Baden, doing construction on a new section. And, uh, he pulled up there and he had an old LTD, but it wasn't no dents on it. He had a real tag on it. And Winters wasn't beat out, and he got out, and, and uh, he had some teeth and driving licenses. And, <laughs> and I didn't trust nobody had both of them at one time. <laughs> you know what a book talks about? I got to drinking with some people that's worse off than me, so I'd feel better about myself. But you know, looking back on it, a lot of them got to drink with me so they feel better about themselves. <laughs> and that's what happened too. But this old boy come up and said, hey Harold, how you doing? I hadn't seen him in five to seven years. And he'd been on the chain gang a half a dozen times before I started drinking. I didn't start drinking until I was 23 year old. And 
I figured he'd joined up with Jim Baker or somebody like that. <laughs> I used to call Jim Baker and them up about 3 o'clock in the morning begging for help. <laughs> with a fearful liquor laying there, drinking that sick, dying liquor. <laughs> and he said, you drinking now? One of that crew would. And, uh, yeah, you know, well, how about pouring it out? Then I'd cuss them out. <laughs> And doing crazy things like that, you know. They meant well, uh, but anyhow, and I did at the time. I was wanting help, didn't know where it's at. When you ain't got no God in your life, you don't believe in one, you kind of lost for sure. You ain't got nobody to call on. But one of them prayers I might have said, or some of them that my wife said, or somebody seen me acting, cutting up, or outside the road doing those things, or laying in the hospital. One of them, or a bunch of them, the one that I might have said, is what got me to AA. I believe in that. That's what got me to AA, through this man. You see, anybody else would have come up to me and had a teaching driving license at that time uh, and said, I know where there's some help. I wouldn't have believed him. But you see, he had been down that bad road worse than me at times, and there he was doing well. And I hadn't... That was an intervention by higher power to put him in that path at that time because I was sick and detoxed and having to go to work under some degree weather and all this. But Jerry was feeling good. He died, this man did, with over uh, 35, right at 35 years sober. He did. He was an active member of AA. And, uh, but anyhow, uh, he said, I'll give you a ride to work. I know you ain't had no license and they perm your boat. You know, it didn't matter. You don't need driving license to the law stops. You know how. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't even stop my wife because she, they seen me with her thinking she was a drunk. They'd get her out walking the side of the road and all that. She'd be hunting at them liquor houses and things like that. They even thought she was. Anybody that put up with a fool like me had to be a drunk too. <laughs> But one thing that's never happened in our marriage, I've never laid a hand on my wife, ever. I've seen some of those things coming up. And uh, I about killed a man one time for beating on his wife. I about killed him with my hands. I used to be strong and could fight and, and, and stuff like that. And, uh, but I did, I hated to see those things. That's never happened in our, our life, never. Hope it never does, there's no reason for it. Uh, but this old boy, uh, he, uh, I got on a drunk and he took me to the detox. And uh, that's how I was introduced to AA and then come back and I would listen to him. We worked together for a few years. And, uh, but I, I didn't, I just come for fellowship. And uh, I didn't do those things here. That was rare. And I didn't, I just went along. I never took the first one, really. Deep, I thought I had. But I was holding on some old ideas, and if you're hanging on to any of them, let go of them. Because it led me back to drinking and a lot more trouble and a lot more illnesses. And one time they shot me back to life in a hospital working out of Washington in Woodbridge and, uh, from drinking. And I was, them good Christian people coming out of the hospital talking to me. It wasn't about AA. I had worked my way out of remembering AA. And uh, I was so tickled not to be dead, had they done that, that I pulled a two week drunk to celebrate being alive. No God in my life. But I just shut it out when I hear about that. The devil done that to me. And uh, you know, I had good people. My wife come from a good family and all those good people that never. Belittled us on account, belittled her on account of my behavior. Because I guess, like my wife, she knew me as a sober person. She wouldn't have dated me if I'd have been drinking and carrying on. She knew that part and didn't know about alcohol and didn't know what to do. So, a few, my drinking bothered quite a few people. I didn't know that so many people didn't care about me until I found out how to stay sober. Looking around, there's a lot, and I try, I care about people, and I did then, but I didn't know how uh, 
how to get along. Uh, my drinking was first. I couldn't understand why anybody wanted to come home on Friday evening out of working real hard, and come home and get out in the yard and cook hamburgers and play ball with the youngins when you could go to the liquor house over and get your teeth beat out. <laughs> I thought they were kind of square, you know, odd for doing stuff like that. But I love those things now. And it's just a shame that my drinking, what time it was, robbed me and my children. We have two sons. It robbed them of a lot of good things. And uh, it did. But it's okay now. One good thing about our family now, uh, and it's, I'm sure it's the case for y'all, our sons uh, have never took up drinking. Uh, I guess they remember visiting me sometime in that gated community and look around. And they don't have the alcoholic tendencies, as I see. Both of our sons have done real well and married girls that don't drink and everything, none of that. And they're raising their kids and they don't care about it, drinking or anything. And they, they go to church and stuff, but they're not holy rollers out here trying to save the world, but they, they just, I'm just grateful for that. And granddaughters, and they're being brought up good and things like that. I love to see that particularly, anyone particularly, younger people. And uh, I tell some young people at the meetings I meet, and they don't know what they can do if they ain't drinking. Their, their, their buddies offering them drinks and, and, uh, I, and uh, temptations. I said, well, I can tell you how to stop them from offering you something to drink. Or, I said, how? I said, just tell them, you, you can't mess with that now. You have this real deadly disease. And don't tell them what it is. And they'll run off and tell everybody to eat up with something. <laughs> I won't mess with you anymore. But you have a deadly disease if you have alcoholism. It is. It's deadly. And uh, I had resigned to die at 40. I had. And go to hell, I reckon. You know, I didn't see no hope. But the intervention was at 39. 39. And, uh, when I finally surrendered, I started winning. That's when that, that man in the bed reminded me, because that last trunk I got on, I wound up in that shape, and then two guys in that picture, the third man, you know, the man in the bed, it reminded me of me. And we got one of them little pictures I framed and put up there at our little meeting. And they come in there and said, uh, they didn't belittle me for drinking. I had like two, this is what I'm tell you about progression. I had, uh, Two days of drinking, four days hospitalization. That's progression, because I had something inside that I learned about AA that I wanted, but I hadn't surrendered. And they told me, when you surrender, you'll start winning, Harold. And they said, and the main thing that they told me, and I hope that any of y'all will do that, and if it was me laying in that bed again, I hope you tell me that. They said, we want you to, we need you to come back. And we all do. Any of y'all that know anyone out there that's been out there, and tell them you need them. Because, you see, that encouraged me. I would not have went back. My pride would have kept me from not going back. And I said, what good can I do? And that old man that died with 55 years of riding, and he wasn't that long sober then, he told me, he said, Harold, we believe if you surrender and win, you can get sober, stay sober, and help some people. And that's the same one and another one to help me get driving license. And these men took off from their work, and they didn't get paid. They had a job. They didn't have an uh, uh, appointment, I mean, a, 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 a title to where they got paid right on. They took off from their work without pay to do those things. I've never shirked that idea, neither. I'll, I'll go out of my way, and it's not about dollars or anything. I'll never get too busy to help nobody, I hope. If I'm in a shape to where I can, I'm going to get somebody that will help them. They come out of that. They took off from work to come sit with me and encouraged me to come back. They seen that I could probably get sober and help people. And that right there instilled me the courage to get up out of swallow my pride, surrender, and get my butt back down there. And that doctor up there 
told me, I said, when I'm going to get out of here, and he, he knew them fellas. Because this doctor's daddy had started uh, AA meetings in Wadesboro. Yeah, he was a doctor also, and he started that. He knew about AA, and he said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to let you leave a day early. Check you out. They got better medicine down in that AA building than we got in this whole damn hospital. That's what he said. For you. For people like you. And that was an encouragement too. And I got out of there and went back. When I surrendered, I hadn't craved or wanted to drink since. And I don't lay around snaky places and hang around snaky people. If you do, you're probably going to get bit one day. And I avoid situations. I can go in a place where they're drinking and carrying on. If I'm supposed to be there, that's all right. I work in some homes that's uh, got $100,000 bars and things like that. And it doesn't bother me a bit. I'm not there for that if I need to be there. Uh, but if I'm off the beam, you know, and not practicing the principles in, in my affairs, uh, I, I could get off the beam. And we always, you never get above the uh, temptation of certain things, you know. And But I try to uh, do right when there ain't nobody looking. And that's, and I try to, I'm not just be a, try to be a good boy in AA. I try to be the same person out there helping folks as I would in here. You know what I mean? Because God knows what I'm doing all the time. And, uh, I'm just tickled to see a bunch of enthusiastic people like this meeting over here. One time I was telling a friend of mine, they had a bowl somewhere around here, and it had names on it. And I said, what is that? They said, that was a waiting list to go see sick people in the detox hospital or jail or something. I said, now that's enthusiasm. I need to uh, pour a bucket full of that on some of them around our place. You know? And, but I, uh, seems like the more... Uh, Button punching and zoom zoom when they get less interested in certain things. I'm I'm not into none of that button punching and stuff like that. I use a dumb phone. I don't even use a smart one. <laughs> and it's for phoning. That's it. I don't do no button punching and all them things like that. My wife, she worked with computers for years. When she retired, she don't even want to pick one up no more. But I'm sure there's good in that, and I know people that have survived on account of that. I'm not putting it down, but I'm just not into it. Uh, but um, we have a good little group there. This uh, latter part of this August, we'll be having a little cookout and celebration. Steve and some others have come up and spoke at our thing once a year. We have this year that meeting, the Albemarle group will be 71 years old. And them old men around there that I remember a few that was there when it was kind of new, you know. And they kept that going. And they kept that going. Like you guys keep this going. Uh, I miss uh, Tom I, and I said over there with Wallace uh, uh, a lot, and, and think about him often, you know, and and the uh, great, great man has done so much help for so many people, and uh, I'd like to grow up and be like one of them fellows, and, and, and just keep trying to help folks, and in return, I, I get help every day. I get help and gain strength uh, and a higher power and and there's a lot going on in the world now and I don't have to get out and behave as sorry as I used to to add to the problems, you know, and stack it on up. There's a lot of things going on and that I don't understand and uh, but I do the best I can. And these young people out there I see it so many of them now that they don't have some example, they don't have somebody decent to talk to. And they need someone that's kind of level-headed out there to help steer them in the right direction. We have lost quite a few people come to our meeting and lost some uh, on account of this COVID. You know, it's a sad thing. And uh, what we have lost, I lost a sister during this time too. We weren't that close and all, but I did lose a sister during that. She wasn't that old neither, but she had some underlying health problems. And a lot of friends have been deathly sick and uh, and lost some good AA buddies in the last few years. 
uh, some illness had come in on them and things. Uh, and and I just wondered at the crap I've been down in them rough roads and all why I'm still around. Uh, well, I guess the answer is God wants me to hang around and help a few people and be decent to my wife and youngins and grand youngins and all that. And be a good neighbor. Be a good neighbor. I live out in the country. We live a half mile back in the woods, and I wouldn't live nowhere I can see the road or nothing. You know, there's three mile of woods around behind us, and we got all kind of critters running around there. And that's just the way we like to live. Uh, I was born and raised out in the sticks, and we got a, a decent little old house back over in the woods there, and we've been debt free. We don't owe a penny for, um, I don't know, 30 years close to it, you know. And don't buy nothing on credit. Don't have to. I ain't got nothing fancy. You know what I mean? Everybody drives a used car. Because when you get it home, it's used. <laughs> <laughs> now, a lot of you guys in there might have a used wife, you know. But <laughs> <laughs> I abuse my wife. But she's the first one, you know. We ain't got nothing in between us or none of that. But I'm fortunate uh, that I... Looking back at it, had she run off and got hitched up and all with them youngins, I'd probably drink myself to death. Deep down, never lost love from wife, family, didn't know how to stop drinking to be a decent husband. I'd get that liquor in there or anything like that, and it was off to the races. And I'd do all them things that you ought not do and stuff. And I don't have to do that more. I'm just grateful that I don't have to do that no more and don't care to. I see some people doing some of those things I know are not honest and stuff like that, and I don't say anything. Well, I guess like some of them, they said a prayer for them, you know. I, God change them so they won't be doing that and bringing that wrath on other folks, you know. I was uh, particularly deaf to, uh, uh, to see them, especially that boy back there who went, went to the hall to pen Jonathan. I'm glad to see that boy down in here. He's a good boy. And this Randy come all waiting down with Kenson and some other people around here in Yonder. And uh, y'all got a great group over here. I appreciate you folks having me and my family and friends. And I want to thank you, Wallace, for having me down. Thank y'all a lot.